Good morning, brothers and sisters. May you each have a very blessed Sabbath. Welcome to these hours of rest and refreshing and study. As we return to our study in Zechariah 6, as we consider further the words of the Lord, shall we praise him and thank him for this time in which we may come together to understand more clearly that which he would have us to know. Shall we now kneel before him where possible in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we may join together, that we may come before you so that we might more directly and clearly understand that which you are presenting to us. Help us now, Father. Direct us in all ways. May your will be done. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to understand. Direct us in our conversation. May your spirit enlighten our minds. We invite you, we invite the spirit, we invite your angels to be with us throughout this meeting. We thank you for this Sabbath that we may rest from our labors. We thank you, Father, and praise you for your willingness to forgive our sins. Direct us now, help us so that we might more clearly understand these words for this time. For this, Father, we praise you. For this, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week, we left off here. Since the whole ritual economy was symbolical of Christ, it had no value apart from him. When the Jews sealed their rejection of Christ by delivering him to death, they rejected all that gave significance to the temple and its services. Its sacredness had departed. Now, the Jews had been vocal in their observance of the Sabbath, yet did they accept the Sabbath in spirit and in truth? Well, they didn't understand its purposes. I mean, later on at the time of Christ, definitely they didn't. So does the world in its lip service to worshiping Christ, does it understand the significance of Christ's sacrifice in spirit and in truth? Um, the world or the church? I'm starting with the world and segueing to the church. But, I mean, obviously people in the world don't understand the cross generally, and definitely not in the church. I mean, for the most part, it's uh, most of Christendom is about living a better life here on earth and, you know, prosperity and happiness and little is said about the cross. When the Jews sealed their rejection of Christ by delivering him to death, they rejected all that gave significance to the temple and its services. Its sacredness had departed. It was doomed to destruction. When the church turned its back on the promises of Leviticus 26 and choose, chose to walk under the curses of Leviticus 26, were they observing the curse and accepting the curse rather than accepting the blessings? Under this situation in Leviticus 26, we are told, if you will not observe my commandments and my statutes, do we see the church today accepting of either the commandments or the statutes? I'm not really sure what the church is, is interested in, to be honest. It seems more just like it's a business to get people to keep going and paying their tithes and offerings and maintain the system. Its purposes don't really go beyond that. Then are we any different within the movement at this point? Well, I would say we definitely aren't interested in, in just maintaining membership um, and getting people to join. But the movement wanted to create an organization. So I guess each of us have to answer that individually. Right. Right. So there isn't... Um, you know, because this is a problem, uh, you know, dealing with the, like the Conrad Vine situation of the question of what is the church and what is our responsibilities to the church. And it seems like um, that 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 is breaking down, that uh, 
a lot of people are, are really not happy with the church as an organization, but they don't really know what to do about it because we're, we're sort of dependent upon the organization. We look to the organization. So that's why Conrad Vine, what I understand stood uh, is that he was talking about like freedom of conscience and uh, the idea that there should be a parallel conference. Uh, I don't, I didn't watch the video. I don't know the details, but the idea that you need a conference at all, I think is something that is a problem that we can't just look to Christ. And we're not talking about like anarchy and disorganization and doing things out of order. We're just saying that, uh, at least I'm saying that I believe that in the last days that the church is just those that are connected with Christ and really the organization has nothing to do with it. But it does really, you know, lend a question, what do you do in, in the context of, uh, yeah, so Orion says he presented that in the same presentation. Um, so what do you do with, well, you know, home churches, I guess. That's, that's one thing. But, but the problem is that people want to have somebody to depend upon rather than Christ. And, and so, you know, it brings up the question of, you know, tithe and offerings and all those types of things. What do we do in a situation where there is no church? You know, some people are of the opinion that we just keep paying our tithe to the conference, like the widow with her two mites, and leave that up to God, what's done with it. That would sort of, it's out of our hands. It's our, not our responsibility. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of questions that arise from that. But here in this context, um, the Jews, as far as their understanding of the temple and its services, it just became a meaningless round. And Adventism is probably the same way. It doesn't really mean anything to anybody. They're just doing the things that they need to do to be a part of that society. But it doesn't really reflect their relationship with God. So we cannot afford as individuals to reject either the commandments or the statutes because we are seeing in this portion from the desire of ages that when the jews rejected the symbol they rejected the literal from that day sacrificial offerings and the service connected with them were meaningless like the offering of cain they did not express faith in the savior in putting Christ to death, <clears throat> the Jews virtually destroyed their temple. So in putting Christ to death, the Jews symbolically destroyed their temple. When Christ was crucified, the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the great final sacrifice had been made and that the system of sacrificial offerings was forever at an end. When we are considering this, I believe it has been made clear that when this inner veil, this great curtain, was destroyed, the Jews then looked upon a most holy that did no longer have the Shekinah glory. It no longer had the mercy seat. It no longer had the ark. Would this not be the holy place that uh, the veil, because people wouldn't have been looking into the most holy anyway to look if the veil was rent into the most holy place. So I think there was like a veil as well to the, the holy place that the people couldn't look into. Well, well, both veils must have torn. They had to. Because obviously if just the second veil torn, then nobody would be able to see into the, into the most holy place. But also, um, you know, I mean, I looked at this back about uh, 35 years ago. So it's, it's uh, not completely fresh in my memory. But when I looked at, at the way that the sanctuary was constructed, that people, even, even when both veils were torn, uh, they wouldn't actually be able to see into the holy place itself because the temple was in a higher platform. And from the angle that people would be at and how far back the temple would be, I mean, they might be able to sort of see into the top of it. 
they wouldn't be able to actually see into the temple from from the courtyard you know if the representations of the temple are correct and how it was constructed based on the steps and all those types of things so uh, i think it's more just symbolic in some ways now we know the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom is what the bible says Ellen White says that it's the second veil that's going to be torn and it opens the, 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 the sanctuary to the gaze of the multitude. So, you know, it's, it's more symbolic than literal. It's not like everybody could just look into the sanctuary because they are at a lower level. So they wouldn't be able to actually look down and see what was there. But um, I don't know if that, that thinking helps anybody at all. You know, back then when I was looking at, it, you know, it's going to talk in the Bible about uh, the second veil of uh, the Deuteron Catapetasma. And uh, the veil of the temple generally just refers to the first veil. So, I mean, it could be that when it says the veil of the temple was ripped in two from top to the bottom, that it's actually talking about the first veil. But also the second veil must have been opened. Right. So. You understand, people understand or not, people don't understand what I'm talking about. Does anybody have comments on that? Well, I always uh, understood that. I just looked it, yeah, when I looked it up in the e-store just now, it, in, in the, you know, where it gives the the, the uh, reference for it, it's, it says the veil the, to, to the, before the most holy place. So I don't know. Yeah, well, that's just an interpretation. But Ella White does say it's the inner veil right there. You can see the inner veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. But it also must be true that the first veil was ripped in two from top to bottom. It couldn't just be the second veil, right? The point when she's using this term inner veil uh, in Five Testimonies, page 750, or Par Patriarchs and Prophets 348.2. And I'll read from that on, in Patriarchs and Prophets, stating that beyond the inner veil was the Holy of Holies, where centered the symbolic service of atonement and intercession, and which formed the connecting link between heaven and earth. Now, the situation here is that she is using the term multiple times of inner veil and when she is using that term she's always referring to the curtain that was between the holy and the holy of holies right but she also says that it opened up the sanctuary to the gazing multitude so Correct. that means the first veil must also have been rent because they didn't open the first veil right they didn't like have the veil open when they would lift the veil, there's actually the veils are overlapped and they would just walk between the veils. So nobody could see into the holy place. So so something must have happened. It just, you know, it's not told us, right, what happened, right? <laughs> right, if you understand what I'm saying, that, that both veils must have been compromised. Correct. You know, maybe in some ways the first veil was just opened. It wasn't torn or something. I don't know. But definitely the second veil was torn because that's what is plainly stated. And it would have to be known that that happened. So the first veil must be opened. I mean, I, I don't believe that they would just open up the, the view into the holy place. No, it, it would be that we would have all of this open. Yeah. It's just that it's not stated. The, the focus is upon the fact that the second veil is also opened. Right. It, it it's one of those little problems, I guess. You know that. Uh, uh, can I, I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. So there's two veils between the holy and the most holy, right? And there's a veil there's between a... holy. So there's a. You have the, the door of the sanctuary which has, a, a veil. Right? Okay. Okay. All right. I but I just want to make sure. It. Now, you know, maybe there's something we don't understand about you know the second temple and how it was built but my understanding is that 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 door also has a veil right there is there are doors to the temple as well but you know, maybe there's something we don't understand you know about how this was constructed but my understanding is that there was 
there's the cedar doors to the temple, Ellen White says, right? They, when the temple is destroyed. But there, there's also a veil, a first veil and a second veil. Otherwise, you can't call it the second veil. In, in, right, in Hebrews, it's going to talk about the second veil, the Deuteron catapetasma. So that's going to be in Hebrews 9, verse 3. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So if you have a second veil, you have to have a first veil. And so that, in some ways, must have been opened. But I, I know it's just kind of, I didn't. I don't know how important this point is, but it's just something that I noticed a long time ago and, and struggled with to try to understand, you know, why it just focuses on the second veil, why the Bible is just talking about the veil, but not talking about which one. Uh, uh, Dana had a thought too. I thought Dana had something to say. Uh, uh, is uh is the veil not um uh, is it not the one which was uh representing like uh when we look at uh permanent structures which were not symbolizing the goal because uh when you read them uh as it was up uh it talks about uh there is uh both with the boats more like with the boat. Okay. I didn't understand what you said. Did anybody understand what his comment was? No, I'm going the veil. The veil, but when you look at the uh, feminine thread, uh, the veil, the veil. The veil. Yeah. It's just, it sounds distorted. It, Brother, distorted. I think you're going to have to chat it. You're going to have to put it in chat because your speech is really garbled. Yeah. And I know I, it's I, not your fault. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just it's the air, airwaves, cyberspace. Yeah. Yeah, because it's too garbled for me to figure out what you're saying. Now, Dana, you had a comment, a question, or something? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry about that. So we know that there's a first veil, there's a second veil, that there's also a door to the sanctuary itself that can be opened, right? Because we know that there's going to be a, a torch that's stuck between the door jam that's going to cause the door to go in flames when the temple is destroyed in 70 AD, right? So, so there must be a door, there must be a veil. I don't think they would have that veil open at, at any time. Some people sort of uh, show it open, you know, in pictures, you know, sort of tied to the side. Uh, some of Uncle Arthur's my Bible friends, I think, has that when you got little boy Samuel ministering in the tabernacle. But definitely, you know, it's it's clear that the way into the entire sanctuary has to be opened up when Christ dies. Now, and, if if you were to consider, if you were to consider for just a moment, spiritual gifts, page one hundred two point one, Mrs. White states. Satan rejoiced that the Jews were safe in his snare. They still continued their useless forms, their sacrifices, and their ordinances. As Jesus hung upon the cross and cried, it is finished. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom to signify that God would no longer meet with the priests in the temple to accept their sacrifices and ordinances and to show that the partition wall was broken down between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus had made an offering of himself for both. And if saved at all, both must believe in Jesus as the only offering for sin and the Savior of the world. I find that to be quite powerful. Mm -hmm. So there, there's quite a bit that she has to say on these subjects. So... Yeah, what you read goes along with Ephesians 2, 13 and 14, 15, and on down. <laughs> okay, but I, I find it interesting, too, because when the temple first was erected after the tabernacle, in the tabernacle and in the temple, they had the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. In the second temple, they had neither. Mm -hmm. Now, in three days, I will raise it up. The Savior's in the Savior's death, the powers of darkness seem to prevail 
and they exulted in their victory. But from the rent sepulcher of Joseph, Jesus came forth a conqueror. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Colossians 2.15 By virtue of his death and resurrection, he became the minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. Hebrews 8.2 Men reared the Jewish tabernacle. Men builded the Jewish temple. But the sanctuary above, of which the earthly was a type, was built by no human architect. Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. The sacrificial service that had pointed to Christ had passed away. But the eyes of men were turned to the true sacrifice for the sins of the world. The earthly priesthood ceased. But we look to Jesus, the minister of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than of Abel. The way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the temple was yet standing, but Christ became being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. By his own blood, he entered into, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 12, 24, Hebrews 9, 8 to 12. Now, Aran and I have had a discussion um, over, uh, you know, Hebrews 9, verse 12. So in the Greek, it just says Hagia, which is um, the plural uh, for holy, and hagion, which is the singular, is translated as the plural in the King James. So my understanding, if if Iran, you know, can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that a lot of people try to argue that, uh, you know, quite a different explanation of Hebrews 9 when it's talking about Christ entered once into the holy place the new translations all say the most holy place. Now, here, Ellen White's talking about, well, she's quoting, where the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, the holiest there in Hebrews, here, you got to look it up, I believe is just the word sanctuary. I don't believe it's the holy of holies, but I have to check that again. Uh, can I ask a question while you're doing that? Please. Yes. That, that last sentence of that top um, quote, it says, he shall build the temple of the Lord and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne. What is that throne? Is that Zechariah, Zechariah 6, verses 12 and 13. Okay. Now, so in Hebrews 9, verse 8. Well, I was thinking, well, I was thinking it was more like, I mean, is it, I hope this is my, is this is my thoughts anyway. Could that throne be uh, individual hearts that he's come into in mind? Okay. I'm not well, sure my, I the question. My initial understanding of this, if, and I, I'm willing to be corrected, is that Christ shall build the temple of the Lord. So in other words, he will build the temple of the Father. He shall bear the glory of the Father. He shall sit upon the throne of his Father. Right. And he shall be a priest unto the throne of his Father. Right. Wouldn't he also be a priest of a priest to us as well? Well, if if we are among the hundred and forty four thousand then would we not be the living stones of the temple in heaven? Right, right. So if we are the living stones, then we would have to be joined with Christ in a very special way, right? Right. Now, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so, yeah. So I don't want to confuse anybody. 
So, um, yeah, so we understand that this is symbolic as far as a temple. We're not looking for us to be part of a literal temple. Right. Yeah. Now, so in Hebrews 9, verse 8, where it says, um, the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Uh, that word there is hagion. So uh, that is a plural form of the word in Greek. But in the Hebrew of um, uh, like the Peshitta, it's going to actually have the singular. And, and the reason why is in Hebrews 9, I know this is kind of a little technical thing, but uh, it's going to use the word hagi, hagion for the sanctuary in, in verse 1 of Hebrews 9. So in Hebrews 9, verse 1. I'm going to do this. Okay, I guess I have to be parallel. Um, Hebrews 9, it says, the, and verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. That word sanctuary is hagion, not hagion, but hagion. It has the omicron instead of the omega for the O sound. And uh, then we have the, and then the next, it's going to say, in Hebrews 9, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, that word there is going to be hagia, right? So hagia is, that would be the, you see here, that's the singular, right? So it should say that which should be called the holy place, Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Right? Because it's it's singular and that should be the holy place. So called the sanctuary. And then it says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called Hagia to Hagion, right? The holy of holies. Right. So Hagia uh, is holy. Hagion is just a different form of Hagios, right? And that's going to be the plural. So it has the singular hagia and the plural hagion. When you get to uh, verse 9, it's going to use, uh, or was it verse 8? Yeah, so when it says the, the way into the holiest of all, it's going to have the way into the holiest of all. Let me see what's the word here. It's, it's going to have a different form, hagiu, and then... In verse 12, it's going to say, Hagia. So Christ entered by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place. Uh, it's going to have the word Hagia, which is the same one that they used for the first compartment. So, so here, the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest. Should be just the word, let me see. No, hang on. So that's actually Hagion. So that is uh, the sanctuary. So that shouldn't even be the holiest of all. In verse 8, it should be the sanctuary. That's the one that's Hagion. And then in verse 12, it's Hagia. So it should be holy place. So that the King James translates that correctly. But the holiest of all is not a correct translation. It should just be the sanctuary. Anyway, I know that's a rather technical issue. But it's just one of the things that Adventists have the view that that Christ didn't go into the most holy place until October 22nd, 1844. Now, some people will argue, well, you know, when he dedicated the temple on the day of Pentecost, he would have entered all the compartments. But that's not what the Bible says here. Right. It says that he he entered once into the holy place, the first compartment, not not the holy of holies or the most holy place, as the new translations say. So I don't know. It, it's just one of those other little points that we're, since we're here, we might as well discuss it. Does that make sense to people? Or is that too much detail? So you're saying that the holy, the holiness of all is the holy place? Where it says the holiest of all? Yeah, that's just another way to say the most holy place. But that where, where it says the holiest of all, it should just say the sanctuary. Because well, it you, just said it, you just said it was the holy place, right? 
No, in verse 12, where it says he entered once into the holy place, that's correct. But it doesn't say he entered into the most holy place or the way into the most holy place was not yet made manifest. It doesn't say that, even though in the King James, it's implying that. The holiest of all would be the most holy place, right? But it doesn't say that in the Hebrew or in the Greek, pardon me. That's in verse 12. Verse 8. Verse, verse 8, 12 you says can... holy place. That's correct. But in verse 8, where it says the holiest of all, that's incorrect. That should just be sanctuary. Well, then, though, you just told me it was a holy place a minute ago. In verse 8? Yeah, in verse 8. You said it was a holy place. I said the holiness of all, that was a holy place. And you said, yeah. Okay, well, then I misspoke. But no, it's not, it's not the holy place. It is the sanctuary. Okay. Right. So, so to the translate is not that wrong. Yeah, so it should be the way into the sanctuary was not yet made manifest. Right. Now, the, the other verse that, that people deal with too is, is also in, in Hebrews, is where it talks about Christ entering into the veil, which hope we have as that's six verse nineteen, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil whither the forerunner for us has entered. And the question is, which veil is it? And my argument is that it's the first veil, not the second. And the way we know that is we can compare it with uh, Isaiah. What's the verse? Uh, Isaiah 22, verse 23. And I will fasten, fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be a glorious throne to his father's house. So this nail in a sure place is like an anchor. Is it Ezekiel 22? Isaiah 22. Oh, yeah, Isaiah. Okay. I'm in the wrong spot. Sorry. Anyway, I've, I've done studies on this before, but, you know, Christ didn't enter into the second veil. And uh, I know there's this guy who, who's uh, really opposed to Adventism now. He used to be an Adventist, and he worked with uh, uh, Vance Farrell at one point. And then he said one day he noticed this verse in Hebrews 6, verse 19, and that totally destroyed his whole faith in Adventism. And uh, now he's a bitter opponent of Adventism. But actually, the story is quite a bit different uh, if you talk to people who knew him, that that wasn't actually what happened at all. Um, he got caught in some kind of fraud first, and then... He just used that as an excuse to attack other people. But anyway, I don't know him personally. I don't know his name. But um, anyway, you, so, you know, people use some of these verses as an attack against the idea that Christ, uh, what we were studying last night, dealing with uh, the investigative judgment. Right? So so they're good verses to know, but they're, they're not totally unrelated to what we're really talking about, reading about here. Sorry about that, Dwight. No, you're fine. The relation between the Father and the Son and the personality of both are made plain in this scripture also. Thus speaketh Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Jehovah, and he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, authorized revised version, taken from eight testimonies, 269, paragraph 6. Yeah, and I think she uses that quote there from the revised version. What's the authorized revised version compared to the revised version? Is there a difference? That's the not the, it's not the American revised version? I believe that there was a revised version that was issued somewhere from the 1890s to the early 1900s. I have a copy of it somewhere. Yeah, because I have a copy of the revised version and also the American, it's called the American Standard Version, I think, which is basically the American revised version. Okay. Um, anyway, here, um, I think the main reason she uses it is it just because it has the word Jehovah in it. Instead of Lord, could very well be. Yeah, I think that's the main reason she's using it, and that's 
uh, we know Jehovah's Witnesses, they used to use the American Revised Version because it had the name Jehovah in it until they got their New World Translation. But uh, but I think that's why she's using it, just so you can see uh, the distinction there uh, between Jehovah and the man whose name is the branch, that there's two of them there, and that that that, that Lord is not referring to, you know, it, it's referring to Jehovah in, in the sense of the Father here in this context. Anyway, go on. The work of teaching the message of present truth is to be carried into all the highways and hedges. Shall we as a people continue to neglect the highways and the byways? It is not in the order of the Lord that we make in a few places large centers where a large work is done and where much means is absorbed. While the many needy portions of the great harvest field are unworked for the lack of means. The highways and the byways need the message of life. They need to hear the word of God spoken in simplicity. Centers will have to be made in many cities where now there is nothing to present the great worldwide work that God has charged us to do. And these need not be expensive centers. Letter 128, 1909, paragraph 11. Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall build the temple of the Lord, or as we've just said, of Jehovah. He shall build, he shall bear the glory and shall sit upon his throne. The earthly priesthood. Sit and rule upon his throne. Okay. Rule upon his throne. Sorry. Sit and rule. It's both. Yes. The earthly priesthood ceased with the death of Christ. But we look to the man whose name is the branch. He shall be a priest upon his throne. Zechariah. 6, 12, and 13. The sacrificial service that pointed to Christ passed away, that the eyes of the world might be turned to the true sacrifice. He was to be the minister of the true covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Here we are to see Hebrews 8, verse 2, and 12, 24. Christ became a high priest of good things, to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. By his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained redemption for us. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 9.11 Nine twelve and seven twenty five. Now is our time to make decided efforts to awaken the people who have never yet been warned. Much thought and labor is given to the printed page. This is well, but if more effort were given to sending forth the living missionary to preach the truth, many more souls would be aroused and won to the truth. While Jesus ministers in the true sanctuary above, he is through his Holy Spirit working through his earthly messengers. These agencies will accomplish more than the printed page if they will go forth in the spirit and the power of Christ. Christ will work through his chosen ministers, filling them with his spirit and thus fulfilling to them the assurance, lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world, Matthew twenty-eight twenty. I am concerned because so many things engage the minds of our physicians, which keep them from the work that God would have them to do as evangelists. From the light God has given me, I know that the living preacher who is consecrated and devoted, who knows how to put his trust in God, is greatly needed. We need 100 workers where now we have one. There is a great work to be done before satanic opposition shall close up the way and our present opportunities shall be lost. Time is rapidly passing. Our publications are numerous, but the Lord calls for the men and women in our churches who have the light to engage in genuine missionary work. Let them, in all humility, exercise their God-given talents in proclaiming the message 
that should come to the world at this time. I think her statement is quite blunt. And it's very direct. We can publish, publish, publish. We can send tons of documents out to people. But if we are unwilling to live the life of a true son and daughter of God, if we are unwilling to be that living example, then all the publications that we can send out are nothing more than fluff. Yeah, this, brings, this brings up a point. Um, you know, because we've we've tried to figure out what it what our responsibility is as far as the message what we've studied, how we are, you know, what, what, what is our role? Are we to, you know, start some kind of work of evangelism in some ways? You know, and I'm still very uncertain about, you know, what the direction is forward. Now, what we do see is that there's all kinds of ministries presenting uh, parts of things that we have studied, but presenting them incorrectly. Right. So you have all kinds of people who have the charts, for instance, in their videos or some charts, at least talking about Millerite history, talking about historic Adventism, but with all kinds of wild ideas. And some of them, you know, create quite flashy videos. We don't. And it's not because we're lazy. You know, we, we could create flashy videos if we wanted to. But we believe that that's not what we're called to do at this point, right? We don't have, like, you know, active slides and PowerPoints moving around and pointing arrows. And, and, and there are a lot of people that do, right? They're, they're trying to, to spread the gospel, right, whatever they understand that to be. But, you know, the work um, that was done in the past was a lot simpler work. I mean, I understand, obviously, in 1850, they're going to publish the Review and Herald. The primary purpose of that was to reach uh, Millerites who had not yet accepted October 22nd, right? Correct. That, right. So to reach those that had had not been part of the Midnight Cry and rejected the message. They were trying to find people who had been Millerites but had become discouraged along the way. That's my understanding of what they were trying to do. They weren't really trying to negate to to go into direct conversation with the with what they would call nominal Adventists, the ones who had uh, rejected October 22nd and were going in a different direction, especially once, you know, they had the Sabbath. They were just trying to preach to yeah. to people who had had been a part of the experience, but not fully rejected it, right? That was sort of in doubt. And, and that's kind of the role that, that this movement has played for, that we've played within the movement for a while, right? Right. It's a similar role. But at some point, whatever point that is, God obviously will point it out, uh, you know, there's going to be a more concerted effort in giving a message to the world, and we still don't really know how that's going to happen. But we do know that the gospel has to be given. I mean, obviously, we didn't just study these things just for ourselves in the sense that we keep them to ourselves. But it is about a change in character that has to happen in order for this work to be done. Right. So God can use very simple means if he has converted workers. Yes. And Brother Theodore. Mm hmm. I hate bringing this up again, but um, the holiness. Did you look up it? Look that word up in the Greek. Yeah. Well, it's the thirty-eight. Well, 30, 39 or forty. Oh yeah, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. Yeah. It's thirty-nine or forty, right? Some, some, uh, uh, like when I have my Greek into linear, it says uh, Greek forty. In the King James, it says Greek thirty-nine. Well, um, it's, it's, it's got holy place and sanctuary. So. Yeah, I know. But that's that's the problem is is you actually have to look at the Greek. You can't just look at the Strong's number. Right. The Strong's number doesn't tell you anything about the form of the word. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry. You, I didn't mean to bring you, it up. Yeah, if you use your E sword and you go to chapter nine and you look for that word 
uh, Hagia, Hagion, Hagion. Um, you can follow it all the way through. And you'll see that it's going to say in verse 2 that the first compartment is called Hagia. Right? Okay. Now, say if you look at the number, it'll say, say Hagion. But if you actually look at the Greek, it says Hagia. Right? Okay. Um, so, right, so Hagion is the word, but it has different forms, whether it's singular or the plural, and, and it defines the words for you in in the Greek. So you can go through it and study it. But, well, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. To... Okay. Any other thoughts or questions today? Because we are now at, at the close of today's meeting. No. I'll just say that our, our next study, we can sort of... Uh, rely on some of the things we've discussed as we look at okay. um, uh, the next study. It's All right. Have connections. So shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We ask, Father, for your blessing upon the next study. Be with us, each one. Help us to learn what it is to completely rely upon you. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.